Wow. <laughs> Power of the presidency. Woo! Why did that group down quick? Yeah. Go on to Mel. Go on that side. You're being the camera. I don't want to be on the Right, I got you guys to the table. Now we can start quieting down again. Let's get started. How's everybody doing tonight? Don't all speak at once. All right, everybody. Grab your seat, quiet down, let's get started. Or we won't be able to hear our wonderful speaker tonight. So, for those of you who don't know me, I'm John Widener, president of this wonderful chapter of the Southern Connecticut chapter of ATD. A couple of quick notes before we roll into our program. First of all, networking. This is one of the major reasons, obviously, everybody comes to this meeting. Um, and if you're thinking about who you meet tonight, keep thinking about it in the context of how you can extend your business capabilities, be you corporate, be you a consultant. The bigger your network, the better you can service either your internal or external client. Uh, to me, networking is all about building a much bigger team than even your organization has at hand. So think about who you're meeting and how they might be effective in what you do. This never happens without this board of directors. And I can tell you, this particular day, being able to pull off at the last minute when our speaker for March 20th was unable to show up, and Anna, big shout out to Anna Samarakova, who was able to, in a three hour period, starting on a Friday afternoon at six o'clock, come up with their, I mean, that's what you need as a teammate, I'll tell you. <laughs> So these are the folks that make it happen, uh, from those who Jim doing our filming over here to Gavin and Steve and Anna on the programming and Sandra doing our social media, Hugh's not here tonight, um, Ann doing our technology. Everybody knows Ross, of course. <laughs> um, power member. Um, you know, membership has its benefits, uh, both as a local member and as a power member. Uh, local member, I'll just give you the financial advantage. How many of you paid 50 bucks to come here tonight? All right. If you remember, it would have cost $37. Do the math. How many sessions do you plan to come more often than once? How often before you break even? We have 10 meetings a year. Um, on a national level, on a national level, you have the opportunity to tap into the immense resources of the national chapter in ATD, the learning, the training courses you can take part in, etc. It's worth your money. Thanks to our sponsors. Again, we wouldn't be able to run without them. Um, Jim Cordes over here is our head of sponsorship as well as our chief videographer. <laughs> and 
anybody in this room who's interested in sponsoring one of our chapter meetings, please reach out to Jim. Uh, we really appreciate it, and you get put materials back on the resource desk. You get your name up in print. You're on our website, and you get five minutes in fame of pitching your business. Um, I actually kind of jumped to this earlier than planned, but um, I don't know, how many of you are going to the New England Area Conference? How many are presenting at the New England Area How many are presenting? I know one, at least two. How many presented in the past? How many presented in the past? All right. Well, as a member of the design team along with Ross, I'll tell you, this is going to be fun. So you still have time to sign up. I, great, I greatly dis encourage you to do so. Um, new members, Suzanne, where are you? We have one new member. Anybody else? I'm a new member. Two new members. Want to take a half a minute to in introduce yourselves? Yeah. Sure. I'm kind of a new member. I was a member years ago, and then I was I joined the Manhattan group because I was working in Manhattan. Um, but I'm back because I now work in Milford. So I guess I'm, I'm kind of a new member. Your name's Larry. Hi, uh, my name is Kevin Conklin. Um, I was a member probably a hundred years ago. <laughs> I remember you. Like years ago. <laughs> um, that was when Ross was president last. <laughs> um, but I'm, I, I'm out of uh, Fairfield, Connecticut. So I figured this is completely convenient to come here and be a part of this. And um, I work for a company called Global Performance Group. I'm a managing partner for that, that firm. And um, so I've want to get back out there into the world and, and meet all of you. So, thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Jane Shan. Suzanne, lovely Suzanne brought me here. I did brand new, joined last night. So, glad to be here. And also, also, I think I'm also an outlier here because I'm actually a marketer. I'm product brand and developer. So, I work for Conair. So, I'm very interested in getting to know you guys and learn what we learn. Thank you. Uh, Sandra, you want to make note of our resource table back there? Sure. Just so you can hear me. So we have a resource table in the back. We'd love you to t take a look at it. And uh, there's a lot of material, particularly around power membership. And there's also some material on the COP program. And um, we, the way we do the, the the resource table is it's a table that you are able to bring items and share with other people and we'd love you to uh, bring really interesting items we want to we want to juice it up and have some interesting things so bring your items that you want to share and they can be about your business that's fine as long as you remember to take them back with you at the end of the evening so um, thank you very much and also I want to just put a plug in for social media um, please make sure you follow us on Facebook you have to like the page like the posts, we'll be posting tonight um, the, as the speaker is speaking and other things, so make sure you like it and share it. And also we have a LinkedIn group, so we'd love you to, be, to see you there online. Thank you. Um, upcoming, next month we have Eric Hager, who will be sharing some amazing experiences that he had recently at ADP. Uh, I'm assuming everybody in this room knows who a ADP is because probably all been paid through their system, if nothing else. Uh, not to mention their HR systems, which also, if you were in a larger company, probably saw them running your HR systems. Um, ADP is a company that is a Wall Street darling, is a company that has made money hand over fist year after year after year, never loses money. And ADP decided that they'd be something more. They had a lot of competition coming up from startups that they recognized as a threat. Well, <clears throat> Eric was hired to help transform that culture. Uh, 
And so the story that he'll be telling, probably not dissimilar to Derek in, the, in a lot of ways, is how do you drive tra change through learning? I think I've, I've known Eric for a while. I've heard him speak a couple of times and worked with him on a, on a forum presentation at one time. He is absolutely delightful. Do not miss it. One more statement before I turn the mic over to Anna to introduce our speaker for tonight. Please fill out your evaluations. You can't leave without doing it. Michelle has the only way out. <laughs> All right. Anna? Thank you, John. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. <laughs> we are extremely fortunate to have Derek Hahn joining us tonight. You heard the story. And Derek and I were exchanging dates through the end of 2017 for possibility for Derek to join us at one of the events and to share his experiences at PayPal. And no dates worked. And all of a sudden, March opened up. So we are just very fortunate that it worked out well and it meant to be. Derek is a chief learning officer at PayPal. He joined PayPal in 2015. And we're going to hear from Derek tonight about his experiences, his initiatives and, and vision in bringing together the learning architecture, content, technology, strategy, and everything else to bring the learning at PayPal successful and impactful. Derek had leadership, um, learning, learning leadership and HR positions and roles with Philips, GE, Pitney Bowes, Alcoa, Heineken, and City. And he's also a Sigma, Six Sigma black belt. And is a speaker at uh, ATT and uh, Shoreham conferences. So please, uh, let's give uh, Derek a very warm, warm welcome. And thank you for joining us. Uh, possible to do this without the mic? Can you guys yeah. hear me? Is yeah. it okay? Yeah. If I do this mic free? Yes? In the back? Yes? Okay? Jim, is this going to make you cry if I do this without a mic? Yeah. It's going to be alright? Yeah, you're good. Right. We're going to try and do this without a mic and try and get away with that for as long as we can. Um, it's hot in here, so I have to do this because I'm now going to stand up front and try and make this work. A um, couple of things I didn't do. <laughs> I didn't test my slides, so let's hope that this all works. Um, I showed up with the laptop prepped, ready to go, had the wrong cord to make that happen. So now it's on a stick and on something. These could all be completely formatted incorrectly. I'll You'd take full like blame. Them. You'd probably like them on too, right? I'll be super helpful. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so in the meantime, um, just the arc of the next hour or so um, that we're together. Yeah. Yeah. I escaped to get out of that. I don't want to do that. Yeah. 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 All right. So, uh, arc of the hour. So, I'm going to talk about me first. I'm going to talk about me first because that's the topic I know best. So, I'm going to talk about me first just to give you some context as to where I've been, what I've done, um, and things like that. Um, then, I'm going to talk a little bit about PayPal and who PayPal is just in case you don't know who they are um, and give you some context around that. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about the continuous learning work and the stuff that we've done for eBay and PayPal in the last three years or so. Um, and then we're going to talk about you and the stuff that you've done to help shift some of the mindsets in your own organization and helping them from their two state to their 2D state, um, their as is state to where they'd like to be state. We're going to share that around the table. So I'll give you a framework to stand that conversation up and then we'll hear from um, folks in the room who want to share. Okay? Questions on where we're going for the next hour or so? Something on that agenda that you'd like to have on that agenda or something you'd like to strike from that agenda? We don't need to hear about you. No, other than that, there's nothing else. All right, let's start, ready? Hey, the slides work. Let's talk about me first. <laughs> right, me first. So this is usually the point in the presentation where I say, if my wife were here, she would tell you, my wife, in fact, is here, right? Uh, <laughs> um, so the reason I start with this slide is just to give you a context as to uh, some of the things that you should know about me, because it's important from a presentation perspective just to know this going in. 
So, things that Kara would tell you if Kara were here, even though Kara's here, and you can corner her later and get more interesting facts from Kara if you'd like. Uh, so, a couple things. One, um, she married a teacher, and that, in fact, is true. So, many years ago, 25-ish, ish, 25-ish years ago, um, uh, so I was teaching, like, in a classroom with kids and bulletin boards and grade books, and I taught uh, both middle school and high school English. Um, anyone ever had a middle schooler? Or known a middle schooler? They're terrible human beings. They're terrible, right? So uh, I had 150 of them in my first outing as a teacher, uh, and they're mean, and, they're, and they'll call you on your shit and say, that's not what you said yesterday, or you told me something different before, or I don't believe you. It's really fun and makes you really pay attention to what you say because they're mean and they'll call you on it. So that was my, how I cut my teeth um, teaching. Um, I still live vicariously through Kara. Kara still has uh, responsibilities for a classroom of students um, in actually a couple of different districts around Connecticut, um, all in that preschoolish, kindergarten-ish, eight, like they do really cool, fun stuff and I get to see the crafts and all the neat stuff and I'll be out on the West Coast and I'll get a text like, hey, look at the caterpillars we made. And I think this is like exactly what I miss from teaching. Because um, it's rare that I get my group to make like really cool caterpillars uh, when I teach now or when I facilitate learning now. So um, that's the first thing, or one of the things um, that she might tell you. Um, she, will tell, she also might tell you that for the last three years, my commute has been pretty miserable. So we live in Monroe. I am officed out of San Jose, California. Um, so my commute is drive down to JFK, um, spend an hour with my friends at the Delta Lounge, and then get on a flight and fly quick five and a half, six hours out to San Francisco because I won't fly into San Jose because there's only one airline that flies direct from JFK into San Jose. You know who it is? JetBlue. Jet I hate JetBlue. I would fly JetBlue. They screwed me three times. That's it. Dead to me. I would walk first. So I only fly Delta and I fly Delta out of JFK over to San Francisco. Then I rent a car. And then if I land at the right time of day, it's an hour to drive from San Francisco down to San Jose. If you land at the wrong time of day, it's three. To get, oh, it's 32 miles. So spending three hours going 32 miles, I, I can tell you everything that's on the 101. I know where to stop. I know if I have to get off in a hurry. I know where the ice cream is. I know everything on the 101 uh, between San Jose and San Francisco. So that commute's pretty miserable for Kara because my timing could not have been worse. It was just when we empty nested. Because, you know, that's not mean at all for me to then say, oh, well, now that we're, the kids are gone, I should go too because that's why. So that, that might be the second thing. That actually might be the first thing, but it'd be one of the things that she would tell you that she doesn't love this commute. Um, so my first year when I was still working for eBay Inc, um, which owned PayPal, we're going to unpack that in just a second. So when I first worked for eBay Inc uh, in 2014, I went out there pretty much every other week. And I used to say to my wife, I'm only gone eight days a month. So I'd leave on Monday and I'd come back on Friday. She's like, it doesn't count if you're landing at midnight on a red eye and getting to the house at 3 a.m. still doesn't count you missed it you have to be here so we had to negotiate really for how long i'm actually gone versus how much i was saying i was gone that was the first year and then the second year got even more interesting i would spend some time in san jose and then sometimes somewhere else so i might go to berlin for a week or i might go to omaha for a week um, or Salt Lake, or one of the other PayPal campuses, and I would do that. And now this is, I just wrapped up year three. Um, in year three, I'm still kind of sort of doing that, where I'm gone for a week, and then 
home for a week or two and then gone for a week or two and then back or two. So when Anna talks about us looking at dates, we were looking at dates like in September. And she's like, so how's this date? I'm like, no, I'm in Barcelona that week. I can't go. Yeah, I know, short straw, right? I have to go to Barcelona in September. Um, and so we were really, really were looking for dates. So when the March 20th date opened up, I said, I can't because I'm in San Jose, but this is a week that I'm home. Um, so that's what that commute's been like the last couple of three years. Uh, two things my boys would tell you. So our older boy, uh, Eric, boy, 26. Uh, so our older boy, Eric, some of you in the room are like, yeah, he's older than I am. Uh, so our older boy, Eric, uh, Eric uh, would tell you, or actually both Eric and Brendan um, would tell you that I tend to over explain things. And I tend to over explain things because I had 150 angry middle schoolers looking at me when I was 20 and 21, 21 and 22, and trying to teach them stuff. And to explain anything to a 13 year old boy, you have to over explain it a bunch of times, like 40 times, in order for it to like stick, even a little. And then they forget the next day. So I, they, so I had to over explain. So my poor boys had to put up with that for their whole lives because that's how I figured, well, it worked for the angry 13 year olds, so you're gonna get that your whole life. So Eric figured it out pretty early on, and um, in order to shut me down, he would just say yes. <laughs> so if I was launching into something and he felt like I had already covered this topic, he would say yes, 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 and I would get it after like the 14th yes, because I'm thick. And it would take 14, and I would be like, oh, wait, he's done. He's full. <laughs> All right, got it. He doesn't need this for me. Okay, understood. Brendan um, took a very different approach. So Brendan, when he was seven, so seven is pretty little. They're still supposed to like you when they're seven. So at seven, Brendan came to me with a question. And I would love, for purposes of this story, to be able to remember what this question is. And I can't remember what this question is, and neither can Brendan, because I've asked him. And he can't remember what the question is. So, but he came to me with a question, and it felt very much like a dad moment. Like, oh, I so get to impart some wisdom on Brendan. I am so excited, so I got all buckled up, and I was ready to lean in, and I started to explain it. And he puts up his little, little seven-year-old hand, and stopped me, and then says, if you can't explain it to me simply, it's because you don't understand it. Oh, wow. I thought, okay, you little shit, following in there, so I care, right? like, I'm not gonna tell you anything, ever. So Brendan figured out very early on how to make that behavior stop. So if you feel like I'm over explaining something, um, please, by all means, just put your hand up because I know what that cue means from Brendan, or just go, yes, yes. Yes, and then we can move on. Uh, so that's the context of, of who I am and where I've been. Um, as Anna recounted for you, I started my very early career teaching. When I cut over to corporate life, I did it at Phillips. Phillips was in Shelton, so I was blessed to just be at Phillips Medical Systems moments from our house. Uh, when I left Phillips and went to GE, I did GE Industrial Systems up in Plainville, Connecticut, and then moved to GE Corporate in Fairfield, Connecticut. Um, so didn't have to leave the state and got to do a uh, two tours with GE, five years. That's where I got my Six Sigma black belt, um, was doing my work at GE Corporate. Uh, after I left GE Corporate, I went to Pitney Bowes. Many of the folks that I know in the room are from my tenure at Pitney Bowes, uh, where I sat on, at the time, the ASTD board, but now the ATD board, um, and we hosted meetings, and we did some fun things. This is back in the Kimberly Bates McCarl day. This is back when Rich, who's still coming, uh, was still, right, uh, Steve was there, so lot, Anna was there, lots of us were there during this time, and we were doing the, the ATD thing during my Pitney Bowes days. I left Pitney, um, went into the city, uh, and spent some time right on Park Avenue for Alcoa, um, leading their executive development during a transition between CEOs. Uh, so Alain Velda was leaving, Klaus Kleinfeld was coming in from Siemens, 
Klaus showed up with a very clear idea of what he wanted from learning. Um, it was the kind of first role that I had where there was true, authentic executive sponsorship. Um, and Klaus was deeply invested in making sure that worked uh, until the wheels came off the economy. And then they started to hemorrhage cash. And then he's like, yeah, all that learning stuff, super bright, really excited about it, glad we invested, no, we're good, thanks. We need to keep, we need to pay the light bill. So thanks anyway. Um, so then I transitioned to Heineken. Um, Heineken was my one stretch with fast moving consumer goods. Uh, Heineken is a super interesting place to work. If you have never worked for an adult beverage company, um, <laughs> and you're an HR person, <laughs> the horror stories, they're tough to shake. They are, they're, it's super, I'll exp I'm happy to have a Heineken with you later and explain <laughs> to you what that's like. Um, the it's, off-site meeting. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's your worst off-site meeting come to life, yes. But it's every day. Uh, so when, when I worked for Heineken, um, true story, worked in the office in White Plains, in the office in White Plains, on the 12th floor, um, there is a bar, um, and the taps are always open. And as an HR guy, I would walk through the bar at 10.30 in the morning, and there would be folks there doing a tasting. <laughs> and I thought, now, now you've ruined my whole day, I have to stay here and see how this turns out. Um, so that was my Heineken gig. I left Heineken, uh, went to Citigroup, uh, did a five-year run at Citigroup, I had a lot of fun at Citigroup. I got to do not only some client-facing work um, and help their IT department um, kind of get out of that near-death experience and feel like they were proud to talk about being part of Citi. Uh, and then I did do another two years doing executive development for other managing directors and directors. Just as I was wrapping up at, uh, at Citi is when eBay called. And eBay called and said, hey, would you like to be chief learning officer? And I said, uh, uh, yes, I would absolutely <laughs> like to be chief learning officer out at eBay. Um, so I took the role with eBay Inc. as my first gig. So eBay Inc., if you don't know, three legs of the stool. Um, so eBay Marketplaces, people know what eBay Marketplaces is? You ever buy anything on eBay or sell anything on eBay? Really? No? I know what you're eating, but no, really? All right. Um, if you bought or sold anything on eBay, that's eBay Marketplace. Then there's eBay, uh, then there's PayPal, and PayPal is the transactional stuff where we move the money around, right? And then, third leg of the stool is eBay Enterprise. So eBay Enterprise is this very quiet little company down in Maryland-ish area, um, and they provide all the back office engine room support for brick and mortar organizations that don't have an online presence. So, uh, what's a good one? Tory Burch. Anyone a Tory Burch fan? Ever bought it? Ever bought it online? Ever think you dealt with someone from Tory Burch? All right, only a few of us. How about Lego, the bricks? You ever buy Legos? You ever buy one online? Do you think you're talking to someone from Lego? You're not. The whole transaction for Tory Burch or for Lego or for about 50 other companies actually happens with uh, eBay Enterprise. And eBay Enterprise stands up everything. The website, the transaction, um, they do the pick and pack, they do the shipping, they do the returning, they provide the customer service. You have never intersected with someone from Tory Burch or from Lego or from Coach or from Johnny, and none of them because it all happened on the backs of eBay Enterprise. It's all, it's all white label, um, and that's their whole business. It's a cool business, particularly for those brick and mortars that have no business trying to stand up their own website, which would be clunky and terrible more often than not. So instead they just pay our friends at eBay Enterprise to do that. So I had those three legs of the stool that was my first gig at, uh, at eBay. After about a year, they announced that the company was gonna split and they said, where do you want to go? Do you want to stay with eBay? Or do you want to go with PayPal? So I said, I'm going to go with PayPal, thank you. It looked like the stock trajectory was a little steeper with my friends from PayPal than it was with my friends at eBay, which seemed rather flat, which is now proven to be rather flat-ish, somewhat not. So there, so there, so I made that decision um, and then spent my last six months at eBay Inc. 
standing up my own shadow organization at eBay so that I could cut away and come to PayPal with the PayPal stuff. So I've been doing PayPal learning full time since the split. The split was in July of 2015, so I'm just coming up on two years proper uh, with PayPal, but three years plus of the commute um, that Carol loves. And uh, this is now three plus years being in a high tech industry, um, and being in a high tech industry that's grounded on the West Coast. All right, so that's about it for me. Questions uh, for, uh, for who I am. Um, let's talk about PayPal. PayPal, there's 200 million users. Who's a PayPal user? Oh, look at that. Really? Excellent. Uh, so not always the reaction I get on the East Coast, by the way. Um, so if you don't have PayPal, you can do it right now and sign up for free. Um, and you can sign up for free. All you gotta do is tie your financial instrument to it. So this is me. Good. It's not, it's me. So it can be any instrument. You can do it with your phone, you can do it with a laptop, you can do it with a tablet, you can do whatever you like. Um, you get connected to an instrument. I don't know why there's a kite here, but you tie it to your bank account or you tie it to your credit card or a debit card or anything where money is. Not your mattress, but anywhere where money is that we can access electronically. And then you use it every time you check out. So the goal for PayPal is to have share of checkout. Checkout means online, checkout means in store, and checkout means in app. So if you've ever played one of those games, any game, any game that's been commoditized, and they ask you in the middle of the game, hey, do you want to buy this cool sword or something stupid? And you say, yes, I want to buy this cool sword because it's going to help me kill this goblin and he's bugging me. And I've been at this for an hour and you spend $2.99 to get the cool sword. So that transaction typically gets processed by PayPal. So if you're doing in-app purchases um, or contextual commerce. So contextual commerce would be you're out either watching videos online or you, uh, you're out trolling on Facebook and you say, I want that outfit. Because you're out, I don't know, uh, pick some random celebrity. Like whomever, I, I could think of a few, but I, yeah. So pick a random celebrity, you're out trolling their Facebook page and on their Facebook page it says, do you want to have her outfit? And you say, yes, contextual commerce, most of that is transacted. Um, on the PayPal stack. Uh, so that's the whole model. Um, it's a stream of nickels, right? So it's a stream of nickels. Like every little transaction, you go spend $2.99 on buying the sword that's going to kill the goblin, and I don't know, we get 2.9 <laughs> cents, right? You, you buy Kim Kardashian's outfit, shame on you for trolling her on Facebook, and, right? You buy that outfit, and there's a skim that comes off the top of the PayPal transaction. You do it in store. It's less than what Visa takes, it's less than what MasterCard takes, it's le way less than what Amex takes. Uh, so if you do a transaction in store, um, so in store, online, um, and the coolest thing is when I'll be out on a website, and this is dangerous now. So the coolest thing is when I'm out on a website and I see the PayPal button, I'm like, woohoo, PayPal button, I can pay with PayPal, and I have one touch activated on PayPal, which means every device I've ever logged onto says, hey, Derek, welcome back. Transaction goes right through. Mm -hmm. So I've got notifications that, hey, Derek, congratulations. You just bought something from barstool.com. I'm like, uh, no, I didn't. And I text Brendan, did you just buy? He's like, yeah, and I paid with PayPal. I'm like, oh, thanks, Brendan. Um, I still get email notifications. So I find out when stuff has been purchased. Gary's laughing. I find out when stuff gets purchased right away. I'll be out on the West Coast getting dings. Um, that I'm buying stuff on PayPal because um, there's it's it's awesome. Um, so that's how this works. Here's the numbers, just in case you want to know. End of 2016. So just a little under 10 billion in revenue. That stream of nickels, right? Just under 10 billion in revenue. Uh, the way that we do that is we process almost 380 billion dollars in payments. So. There's, I don't know how many swords that would take. I can't do that math to kill those goblins. So a lot of them, all right, 100 billion if they're three bucks each. So 300 billion uh, in total payment volume, um, roughly five billion transactions for us to come up with that $10 billion. So that's more like a stream of dimes. But that's how that maps out. 
Um, and then we very closely track our mobile payments. Mobile payments, we're trying to figure out who's doing more without the use of their laptop and without the use of their tablet. So we want to be sure that we're mobile first and mobile enabled. Mobile first is actually the first thing that we adopted from a learning perspective, was mobile first to try to figure out how we're going to get in the hands of the people who already have a device in their hands. So we do mobile first. Um, but part of that payment volume, we did almost 70 billion in uh, payment volume, 1.4 billion payment transactions, and one, uh, 17 million net new active accounts. So net new actives are people who have found us for the first time, they've found us for the first time, they've created an account, they've created an account and they've used that account twice, you are now a net new active for the next six months. And then if you drop off the radar and we never hear from you again because you only had to do it in order because you wanted to do it and then you did it, and then you're like, nah, I don't want to do that. Uh, then you fall off our net new active. So at the end of the year, we were up about 17 million um, adding to our 200 million active users. PayPal by the numbers. Um, I'll send you this deck or I'll make it available. I won't send it to you. I'll do whatever, if you want these slides. Um, in the notes of this slide are all the provisos and all of the legal stuff that would have to say, these are forward-facing statements and please don't ever take them seriously. Like all of that jargon um, is all posted underneath. That's where all of those uh, little um, <laughs> five, six, seven, and eight uh, little uh, footnotes are. Um, that's what those are. Questions about the company or its structure or where we are or what we do? There's 18, uh, yes? Do you have any provisions for a nonprofit organization? Do we have provisions for a nonprofit organization, meaning do we cut them a break and let them do cooler things <laughs> with our technology and not charge them the same kind of fees? <laughs> yes. Yep. There's a whole big branch of PayPal called PayPal Gives. PayPal Gives lives actually outside of PayPal proper. Um, but yes, they do all of that not for profit. Thank you. Yeah. How's the the U.S. and the global split in terms of the user and the revenue? Yeah. Right. So, uh, so to split the revenue, I couldn't do because I can't. I'm not that close to it. Um, I can tell you where we have a commercial user face and where we don't have one. Um, so. Lots of our revenue is coming from the U.S. and actually from the Americas. This is where we have our strongest footprint. Um, we've made good inroads into uh, Western Europe. We're struggling with Eastern Europe. Um, as soon as you get into Asia Pac, we have nothing. So we have no consumer-facing technology in India. We have no consumer-facing technology in China. We have limited cons and so here's how I learned this lesson. It's a great question. So I'm thinking I'm going to roll something out like global onboarding and everyone has access to the same stuff, right? So I create exercises in my silo in San Jose saying, oh, well, yeah, just go out and figure out on the app how you're going to do that. And I'm getting feedback from Germany like, we don't have your stupid app. I'm like, oh, right. Right, I forgot, sorry. So there are, there are some countries where we have employees that we only have merchant-facing technology, we don't have consumer-facing technology. Other questions about something? Yeah. Um, just a thought, I mean, competition has got to be getting harder and harder in this area, right? Uh, kinda, sorta. Mm. So, uh, so when I used to work for Penny Boats, when I used to work for Penny Boats, um, we used to say that um, we comfortably had 90% of the market volume. Um, and uh, that was us being polite. We actually had a little over 96%. We used to let a couple of three other players go fight over the bottom 3%. We didn't care. It was kind of funny to watch, and we just let that happen. And that was so for the payment space, um, the payment space, uh, PayPal is 17 or 18 years old. Um, we are 15 years more mature than any of our competitors. Um, the folks who are coming into this space are struggling to get the same kind of bandwidth and to have all three of those facing where you can do it in, uh, online, in-app, and in-store. Um, so there are some startups that get a little bit of press and people get really excited about them and they go, look how cool they are. Um, they might even be like featured on Shark Tank. Like they're, they're right, they're so cool, right? And people think they're so cool, but in reality, their volume is so low, and their stack 
is so unstable that they really can't transact at the same kind of volume. Um, so kind of, it's kind of heating up. There's a few players to watch who matter. So like Amazon, they matter, right? And they matter because they're basically just buying everything that they touch, right? They're like, oh yeah, we used to partner with these trucking companies and have all of our stuff moved from place to place. You know what? Uh, we just own them now. And I passed my first Amazon 18-wheeler today on my drive into the city. And I thought, ah, oh, ah, oh. <laughs> right? Um, but they're buying everything. And if you look at Amazon as in its totality, there's roughly 400,000 people that work there today. Roughly. It's like 380-something. So, meh. There's 400,000 people that work for Amazon today. They're forecasting 1 million employees by 2020. And they're not planning to do that through acquisition. They're just planning to do that through organic growth. That's so scary for me, right? Like, you think Walmart's a big, angry bohemian? Yeah, like, they're big and they're less angry because they're West Coast. But, <laughs> so, but, yeah, they're huge. So they matter from a payments perspective because they can enable it. And they can enable it at scale, yeah. and they can afford to take the year or three or five that it's not commoditized. Mm -hmm. PayPal already lived through that, and we lived through that standing on the shoulders of eBay. So 80% of our revenue used to come from eBay. They were our biggest customer, because that's where the transaction volume was. And if you were out on eBay, and you didn't want to pay with a credit card, because why would you trust eBay with your credit card? You could just pay with PayPal and you can pay with PayPal and that whole transaction. So that's what allowed the lift for PayPal to get to the place that they're in. Amazon has the depth and the breadth to be able to sustain that and support that. There's a very few players who have that kind of real heft to make that happen. So it's kind of a crowded space, but not stuff comes and goes. Remember Google Wallet? No, of course you don't, right? So like it came and it went, like nobody used it and, they were, and Google lost interest. They're like, no, let's make self-driving cars. So they're off doing that now. So other things like distract them. So people don't use that as much. People who are in it and mean it, yeah, they could, they, it can be a competitive space. Yep. Other thoughts on the business or the industry? Yeah. Quick follow-up question on that in competition. Uh, what do you see like, a, like Square or those payment thing? Is that a competitor or is it actually not? Square? Yeah. Uh, kind of. I mean, you know, Square is like transactional and they do it right on your phone and it's like that quick little cute thing that you can do and it's highly transferable and they're small. They're a bit player, all things being equal. Um, and for fun, lots of the transactions that take place on some of our competitor platforms, like Apple Pay, mm -hmm. actually get transactions on, uh, transacted on the Braintree stack. And we own Braintree. So we see the transaction, we don't get a dime, we get a penny or a tenth of a penny, but we actually don't care about how little we're getting from the transaction because we get all the data and we can see all the transactions that are happening. I don't know if that's true of Square, but it's definitely true of like Apple Pay and some other stuff. All happens on the brain tree step. And the question that I usually get on the other coast is, uh, what about Venmo? Anybody use Venmo? Those of us who are under the age of 30 who use Venmo, yep, yeah, right. This total millennial silly tool that as that they verb like, hey, I'm gonna Venmo you cash for lunch, and they Venmo money back and forth. My boys do this, and oh, my favorite was my older Eric comes to me at one point and goes, ah, oh, I can't believe you work for PayPal. Venmo's so much cooler. I'm like, yeah. We own Venmo, you dummy. Right? So, like, we own them, but they're not commoditized because you make no money. PayPal makes no, Venmo makes no money. They just hemorrhage cash. And they hemorrhage cash because it's all about customer acquisition and it's about getting them in and getting them familiar. And people love Venmo because of the social feed. So if I were to Venmo you cash, this is the big feedback we get. People are shaking their head like, that's not why I use Venmo. But yes, the, so my West Coast friends, my West Coast friends would argue that what they love about it, and if we asked Eric or Brendan, why do you use Venmo to send money back and forth? It's so they can post in their social feed, in the Venmo feed, 
And if I open a Venmo on my phone, I can tell you something silly that someone just paid someone else silly for a silly amount of money for. And they'll say, I just sent Joe 567 for pizza. <coughs> and that shows up in the Venmo feed. But people put, I so creepy, so weird, right? But for that, like it's a thing. And they love it. And, but we haven't figured out how to make money with it yet. So, yeah. There is some young men who are here who are looking at me like, shut up, old man. You don't know how cool Venmo is. It's OK. It doesn't hurt my feelings. I know I don't know how cool Venmo is. Um, so it, it's OK, though. Because we own them, and, um, and they help, and they help with our net new actors, and they help us. Um, so we like that. All right, other questions on the industry or or anything? Yes. What do you do to generate customer loyalty? Do you have points programs or rewards or incentives to try and keep people? Uh, the short answer would be I don't know. That's the short answer. I've never thought about that. What do we do to generate customer loyalty? Um, so, all right, so here's one good example I can give you. Um, so about a year and a half ago, we bought Padient. Padient is your in-store uh, tracking. It's like if you have a Subway card or a Dunkin' Donuts card or any one of those silly loyalty cards for your, for your typical like small retailer like that, like low transaction volume retailer. Um, so Padient, now that we own them, so we've made them part of the package, so some of that loyalty business, um, we can help other customers that are part of the PayPal family understand some of those purchasing patterns. So that they can send you very specific coupons right to your device. So, because we know on the second Friday of every month, you get a meatball sub from Subway. And we know that. Creepy thing for us to know, yes. The fact that we send you a targeted coupon on the third Friday of the month, because you just had one, but can we lure you back to get another one, because now it's two bucks off, that we can do. So um, that's one example, but I really don't know what the incentive is to keep using PayPal, other than it's super easy, and once you're logged in, you can use it everywhere. We just did um, a round, uh, cashless trip around the globe, and we did a cashless trip around the globe where the guy went to like 18 or 20 countries and had to go to all these cities and had to carry no cash and do all of his transactions through, brain, uh, through uh, PayPal. Ease of use. And had to stay in hotels. Like I can't imagine checking into a hotel and being like, no, I just have my phone. And have that be okay. But he was able to like stay and travel and get on airplanes and do things that are, again, I'm not cool enough and I'm not young enough to understand how all of that would work, but he did this whole traveler blog and we tracked him all around the globe. And so cashless, that's a thing. Risk is a thing, safety is a thing. But I don't know if there's real incentive like points. There might be. I don't think so though, I think I'd be getting them. I should go find out, right? Like I should find out if there's points because I'm kind of pissed off now that I'm not. Uh, but I don't think I don't think there's loyalty points. I don't think, but I could be wrong. Yes. Other stuff about the industry or PayPal. Okay, my plan was for this to be like a two-minute slide. Um, okay, so continuous learning while we're here. Um, continuous learning while we're here. So, uh, Person by Deloitte. Anyone partner with Person by Deloitte? Person by Deloitte, it's a great service. This isn't a commercial and I'm not telling you to go use it. I get uh, tremendously rich data from Burson. And this is why I said ahead of time that I'll make these slides available to you because I know this slide is an eye chart, so don't worry about it. You'll have access to it. Um, here's what's important about this slide. So uh, Burson went and did all the research and did all the heavy lifting and came up with, hey, this is what your typical learner looks like today. Your typical learner in the workplace, what they look like today, and they are distracted, and they're overwhelmed, and they're impatient. You know who they sound like? Angry 13-year-olds from middle school, right? They're distracted, and they're impatient, and they're overwhelmed, and they've got a whole lot of information available to them, and they've got a whole lot of information available to them, and they want it packaged up for them so it's quick and easy and accessible and relevant, and they don't want to go hunting for it, and they just want to present it and available to them because they're only giving 1% of their mind share to what's happening and how they are developing themselves. 
So what they're looking for is, I want my content to be untethered. Meaning, if I have to log in through VPN, and then log in through your LMS, and then click through to get to the content, you lost me a long time ago. So it needs to be untethered from the rest of the system. Difficult from a regulatory perspective, important from a learner consumer perspective. Second is it needs to be on demand so they can get it anywhere, anytime, in any form that they want, um, however the mood strikes them. So on demand learning so that they can download it if they want to download it, they can um, print it off if they want to print it off, they can collaborate in a social space to learn it with somebody else. So on demand um, and available all the time. Um, collaborative in the spirit that they can learn from others and share what they have learned. I found it amazing the number of people who go out when they get uh, interviewed by a company or they get interest in changing to a new industry. They'll Google that company and then read the reviews like their Yelp reviews and they'll read up on the company. So like Glassdoor is a big way for folks to understand the company culture that they're moving into. Um, when our younger was getting ready to go to college, uh, he spent an in disproportionate amount of time on College Prowler. Because College Prowler is populated by kids who sit and review the college that they're seated at. And they give them A, B, C, D grades. Like, this is an A plus party school. <laughs> or this is C minus party school. And Brendan, our younger, used this as decision criteria for which schools to apply to and which ones fell off the radar. Um, and there's really kind of nasty measures that they have on College Prowler. So being able to go out and shop and find out what other learners think about the learning is important to your learner. And then last, um, feeling empowered to get the skills that they need when they need them. So uh, the old adage used to be that if you learn something new and you master the skill, it stands in your good service for about five years. And that you can flex that muscle for about five years before you gotta go back to the well and refresh. Um, that half-life is now about two and a half years. So if you've mastered a skill and you feel pretty comfortable and pretty confident, you've got about two and a half years of riding that crest before you've gotta go refresh, renew, and get up to speed. So with that, they need to be able to do this on their own, untethered, in an empowered way that they can do it with somebody else and drag them along for the journey. First of my boy, great data. So here's what we did when we got this information. So we decided to do three big things. So we decided to wrangle our vendor chaos. So when I got to eBay Inc., eBay Inc., three different companies. When I got to eBay Inc., I started on February 3rd. It was 30 working days into the work year. I had 96 vendor contracts on my desk waiting to be signed. Sadly, some had already been signed and were in process. I had 96. This was day one. I said, and the expectation here is to do what? And they're like, oh, well, this is what the business needs and this is what they've asked for. So we spent four months unpacking who do we have, what are they doing, what are they offering, how is it different from what this other guy is offering, why are we not doing this at scale? What does this mean? So we decided to wrangle our vendor chaos. We put our customer at the center of everything that we do. So I had three primary customers with those primary different businesses. I also had our chief HR officer who was very interested in stopping the hemorrhaging that learning was doing from a spend perspective. Um, so we took all of our customers and figured out how we're gonna keep that whole collective group happy. Um, and then we decided we we're gonna exploit technology for a fr frictionless experience. So how much technology can we introduce? What's the appetite? And it was really being attendant to these. How can we help folks collaborate? How can we help them get access on demand? How can we get out of the old school of, well, if you're not vpn in and you're not on the LMS, you're out of luck. So we had to move in a new direction. So here's what we did. So wrangling our vendor spend. So wrangling our vendor spend, we did a 90% variability reduction. That's a polite way of saying that we got rid of a whole lot of vendors who were such special snowflakes that they would only deliver like in San Jose on a Tuesday to a group for all smaller than eight and you needed to fly them in business class and you need to fly, like, I was like, You're, and I gotta say, so this is my first West Coast job and I had been there a month-ish, right? 
and I'm talking to these vendors, and they're like, well, yes, yeah, so this is our contract, and this is what our, our, my expectations are, and this is, this is what we do, and we've been doing this for four years. I'm like, that's great. I'm like, okay, so here's what I'm expecting, and he, here's the new day. So here you go. And they were just like, well, no, none of these, none of these conditions are acceptable. I'm, I'm like, okay, well, it's great talking to you. Thanks so much. They're like, no, 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 wait, you don't understand. We've been doing this for four years. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. They're like, people ask for us by name. I'm like, okay. So here's the new set. And they're like, no, 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 you still have to. We were not kidding. Presentation skills. Now, presentation skills, there's really good vendors who can teach presentation skills. Um, and there's some, it, depending on what kind of depth you need in presentation skills, but we're talking like presentation 101. Like blocking and tackling presentation skills, like have a story and tell it, <laughs> right? Feel, feel, feel lifted? Uh, so that was, that was the content, essentially. These are two guys who were living in Mexico. I'm not making this up. They, I had to fly both of them to San Jose because I had to fly both of them to San Jose. They would fly to San Jose. They would only fly business class out of the beaches of Mexico. They would come to us. They would do uh, one day. They would do one day for no more than 10 people um, ever in the room ever. No one can audit. No, they had no printed materials, none, zero, not even a notepad or a pencil, right? And they showed up and he, no kidding, when I fired them, which was fairly unceremonious. And I'm like, no, no, no. And the, it was triple the cost of everybody else. So triple the cost of everybody else, can't have more than 10 people in the room, you have to fly two of us up from the beaches of Mexico and we'll only do it on Tuesdays in San Jose when it's not raining, like it was absurd. <laughs> so I said, yeah, okay, we're, we're good, we're done. They were like legitimately offended and stunned that I would fire them. They were stunned. And I was coming from the East Coast, right? So I kept coming home being like, I don't know what in the hell they think is going on on the West Coast, that this is okay. But every time I would go back out, I had to go fire a half a dozen vendors. It was terrible, it was really hard. So 90% variability reduction meant, let's find the people who are doing this and doing this well, let's figure out how to do it at scale, let's get people actually talking to each other who sit on the same floor and say, you're not that special a snowflake, you don't need your own presentation skills class this one's just fine, I promise. And if it's not, I'll fly your friend up from Mexico. Right? And they would say, okay. So begrudgingly for the whole first year, that's what we did in order to get to a place. So here's what this created. It created an opportunity for actually for us to do stuff at scale. So because now I had vendors who were like, I'm gonna come 20 times. And I'm like, yes, you are. You're going to come 20 times. And every time you come, I'm going to have 25 people in the room. And you're going to do a morning session. And then you're going to go have lunch. And then you're going to go back to do an afternoon session. So I'm going to get 50 people through in a day. And I'm not paying you any more than I would have paid you just for the one time. And they're like, oh. Uh, I'm like, because I'm paying you for the day. And it's still a pretty good rate. And they're like, mm, so, OK. So that, I was able to get double the number of people through for about a 20% reduction in overall spend. Did you measure the experience, the learning? Did, they did I do what? Did they learn? Oh, did they learn? So yeah, we did a couple things. So we did the smile sheet, right? Like, hey, how is this? Um, and we set the bar at like four out of five. So had to be 80% of the content for 80% of the room, 80% of the time. Had to be relevant, had to meet the need, had to make sure that they were getting what they needed. Um, so that was the measure that we used. We also, for some targeted courses, will do a 12-week follow-up. And we'll do a 12-week automated follow-up that reaches back out to them to say, what you should have learned is this. And that's really a variability control, because I can't be in every room and my team can't be in every room, so we have just faculty that just get stood up. So in order, to do, in order to minimize that variability, we'll send automated messages to the participants and say, you should have heard about this model introduced during the course. How are you applying it? What do you, give us your feedback. And if they come back and go, never seen this before, don't know what the hell you're talking about, we go, that guy's off script, so we know that that faculty member's off script, versus, yes, so that's the impact measure that we have. For the big, like, for the big stuff, like presentation skills and the, the big open enrollment project management stuff that we're seeing hundreds of people a year, that's what we do. Uh, okay, so that's how we wrangled our vendors, right? Get the spend under control, do it at scale, 
blow it out so that it's repeatable, reliable, consistent, and global. Mm -hmm. Those are the four terms. Ask anyone on my team, repeatable, reliable, and they will finish. Repeatable, reliable, scalable, and global, because that's all I said for the whole first year. Every time they came to me with an idea, I would say, is it repeatable, reliable, scalable, and they would say no. And I would say, okay, come back, and then we come back, and then we have that solution. Because I didn't want to stand stuff up in San Jose that we couldn't do anywhere else. Yep? Could you say more about two times the engagement increase? Yeah, so the, the, the 2x learner engagement was we created so much volume by just having our vendors um, aligned around what our expectations were, I was able to get twice the throughput. So it's just raw kind of butts and seats count. Um, I was able to get double the number through for about a 10% reduction in overall spend. So we spent less and touched twice the number of people. Thank you. And how am I doing on time? How terrible am I on time? Yeah. Yeah. What are we supposed to be done? 20 minutes? 20 minutes? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, yes, yes. All right. See, I'm over explaining it. Thank you, Bob. Uh, so um, so we, we also put our customer at the center of everything that we do. So we're a product shop. So PayPal is a product shop. We build products. We talk about things like NPI and NPS. So when things are in new product planning, when they're in new product introduction, when they're in post-launch maintenance, that's the language that the business uses. So me showing up with an Addy model or me showing up with a SAM model, not helpful to them. They don't know what I'm talking about. Oh, and bonus, they don't care, right? So, but if I talk to them about, hey, we're just about at the end of new products planning, because we gathered all of our voice of the customer, and that's what fed our new product planning, and we're about to cross over into new product introduction. Are you interested in experimenting with us? I don't have to say, do you want to be part of this pilot? I say, are you interested in experimenting with us? Because we plan to test and iterate, because that's their language, not mine. So putting them first, and talking to them in their language, and again, not a tech guy, and no, not a West Coast guy. So it takes a lot for me to put on this show and have it even come off as marginally authentic, which is why I have much nicer people on my team who are actually, like, a, they're great product managers because they'll sit with them and have those conversations in very thoughtful ways and they don't get mired in uh, the language of learning. We did strategic prioritization and cultural alignment. So we looked at what's important to the business, from a strategy perspective and what's important from a cultural pillar perspective. And we made all of that available to our internal faculty, to our vendor partners, and to our fellow learning leaders across the organization. So for the last couple, three years, we've had summits. And the summits, I bring in uh, some of our vendor partners, and I bring in some of the learning folks from within the organization, and I'll bring in our adjunct faculty and actually put them in the same room. And the vendors talk to each other about the stuff that they're teaching and the models that they're using and they look for overlap and they look for contradiction and they look for where one could stand on the shoulders of the other and then they go, yeah, if you're ever gonna teach that, I'm gonna do this and that's gonna help us do this. And then we give them the whole show about what's important to our culture and all of our vendors leave going, I don't know why all companies don't do this. Because instead of me acting like the liaison, trying to translate for our 12 surviving vendors, hey, this is what's important and this is what matters and this is how this works, I just put the 12 of them in a room and let them talk to each other and it's remarkable. The, f the stuff that they come up with is way better than the stuff that we could have come up with. Um, because they know their stuff better than we do. And they see the intersections more naturally than we do. So that's what else. Ross. Who are your adjunct faculty? So my adjunct faculty are two dozen folks within the company who have actual jobs um, who wanted to also facilitate. Are those used as developmental steps as part of your talent management pro process? Uh, so it's, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, so sort of. So you can't be considered to be adjunct faculty if you're underperforming. So if you're in the bottom 35%. Uh, because we have two lower tiers. If you're in the bottom 35%, we won't consider you to be part of adjunct faculty. Um, I've never proactively gone out and said, hey, you're one of the top performers, let's get you in front of a group. I have had senior leaders who are very interested in sharing their knowledge. This just happened this month. I had some from within the technology organization say, hey, I, I really want to teach. I said, okay, Shree, 
what do you want to teach? And he wants to teach uh, emotional intelligence because he's really passionate about it. I said, okay, Sri, let's sit down. And we sat down and we walked through his stuff. I'm like, okay. So he's got it. He's good. He knows what he's talking about. He's got the content. And I said, if you want to do this, I'll set you up as part of the executive speaker series and we'll make an open enrollment and we'll see how many folks come. He's fantastic. Fills the room, loves to do it, is passionate about it, is carving out his own time to do it. So he's part of the, but he's, he's like a big grown up. Um, and I was like a little afraid when he's like, can I see you? I'm like, shit. Like, but but no, that's what he wanted and we let him, and he loves it. And, he's, and he doesn't have to do any of the administration, it's not manager outlook, it's all. So we took on all the burdens and stuff, and now he just gets to show up and someone hands him a clicker and says, here you go. And he gets to do his thing and then leave and everyone, and he's awesome. So we do do that. But we haven't made it part of the targeted talent management. So what is important to PayPal from a cultural perspective? Uh, so the, so we have four cultural pillars that, that we uh, kind of peanut butter spread over all of the learning that we offer, whether it's at the executive level or it's at the teammate level. Um, it's our four cultural pillars are innovation, um, so thinking of things differently, inclusion, uh, listening to all the voices in the room, uh, innovation, inclusion, uh, collaboration, uh, working across boundaries, oh, and wellness. So wellness, I know, how squishy could that be? West Coast! Uh, so, um, <laughs> wellness, wellness is one of those things like, hey, are you taking care of your whole self? When I ever, what, so, so I take a bunch of conference calls at home, right, because I'm home half the time, and Kara was home, and I take calls late at night, or late in our time, like dinner time, right, because it's still four o'clock in the afternoon at that time, and Kara walks by at one point, and walk by just in time for someone on the other line to say, yeah, it's really important that you're able to bring your whole person to work. And I was just like, oh. she's like, how do you not just burst out laughing? <laughs> so that's the other kind of cultural pillar is wellness, making sure that you're taking care of yourself um, emotionally, physically, fiscally is the third branch of that. Um, so we try to make sure that everyone's well. Yeah, that one's tough though, wellness. It's hard to teach that, right? But we do lots of good things. We like send people mindfulness apps and say, you should download this mindfulness app because this mindfulness app is going to remind you to stop and meditate <laughs> and it's going to ding and have you record your mood. Oh. So it's good for them. <laughs> Whatever works for you, like love it. So that's what we do, right? And you got to see the guys in Germany when I'm like, oh yeah, download the wellness app. They're like, mm, mm, no. <laughs> so, all right, so that's how we put our customer at the center of everything we did. The last bit. So the last bit, exploiting technology to make this as frictionless as possible. So I said early on, we try to get in front of folks with the device that they already have in their hand. Right? So they've already got their phone in their hand, they're already scrolling through their Facebook feed, they're already flipping through their Instagram thing, whatever that is. They're already using the Snapchat thing. They're already using those tools anyway. Right? So we piggyback on those tools and use them and exploit them for things that draw their attention back to PayPal Learning. Mm -hmm. So we branded PayPal Learning and then we stood up our Facebook group. So our Facebook group is... Uh, no, no. Our Facebook group is a private group, and you have to ask. Like, hey, can I join your group? And then we make sure that you're an actual employee, not some guy that's gonna send us like spam, 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 spam. Um, and once we confirm that you're an actual employee, then we add you to the Facebook group. And then we'll go out there, someone on my team who's under the age of 30, will go out to the Facebook group and post stuff in the Facebook group. And she'll post things like our Harvard Manager Mentor course of the month is on uh, influence. Now, how many people click through from that back out to Harvard Manager Mentor and take the course? I have no idea, right? But I do know that it shows up in 1,300 people's feed for the folks that have joined the group. And even if they just skim through it and it doesn't trigger like, I need to go take that influence module for Harvard Manager Mentor, at a minimum, for a hot second, they thought about learning. And they thought about PayPal learning because it says PayPal learning and it gave them something so it could at some point that's the get right so we do the same thing with Twitter and we do the same thing with Instagram um, that weird one that's above Twitter is Periscope have you used it 
Uh, creepy. So, uh, Periscope allows you to take your phone and do this. And in Periscope mode, people all around the world can tune into your phone and see what's going on. Mm -hmm. And they can watch what's happening in the room. Right? So we'll do that if we have a guest speaker. And if we have a guest speaker who's going to last eight minutes, not 80, we'll do this. <laughs> right? um, because that eight minute speaker might be really good. And it might be Dan, our CEO, or it might be our CFO, or it might be someone really important. And we want the whole employee population to have a chance to do that. So we'll make it available on Periscope. And then we use Poll Everywhere. Poll Everywhere, super dangerous tool. Super dangerous tool because you're polling in real time in the room and the results are shown in the room. Um, so uh, di I didn't do one for today. I should go. Oh, exactly. uh, so, and I'm right at this moment so authentically glad. But, uh, uh, so a poll everywhere poll allows me to put up a slide that says, how am I doing? Right? And I can say, how am I doing as a facilitator? And you have the one to five scale of great to abysmal. All right? And you can just text in. Right? And all you do is text in like, you know, 28880 and then whatever your choice is. Right? And then the bars grow in real time. And you can see that feedback. Now, helpful for the instructor to get that feedback in real time, because now he knows, and now I would never ask, how am I doing? I might ask, are you understanding this concept or are you getting there in order to get feedback? Super helpful from a learning perspective, because if that course takes place in Chennai, I can see that data on the back end and see what those reports look like after the fact. Have you ever heard of Conveyor? Conveyor? It's a new app, it's a new learning app, and, and they say it's for the um, new learner with the attention, fly of a, attention span of a fruit fly, yeah. and it allows you to do courses that you can set, they come in a text link, so you can get text, it, like if it's an eight day course, it will come once a day, and you can listen to it whenever you want, but you can put on videos, and you can put on polls, you can put on whatever, and people can sign up for the course, nice. and it can be like a two minute video nice. that they yes. get each day, and cool. it comes to their cell phone yeah. in a text. Yeah. So really new, it's new, but it's, it's cool. When did you implement all the social media? Uh, somewhere within the last 15 months since the split, because it's all PayPal specific. So the one thing that we didn't implement in the last 15 months is our LMS. So our LMS, I stood up when I was at uh, eBay. It's Cornerstone On Demand. If you're shopping for an LMS, talk to Cornerstone. If you hate your LMS, talk to Cornerstone. It's a good LMS. Um, it's my second instance with them. I stood them up at Pitney Bowes 15 years ago when there was four guys working out of a garage. Um, now it's like a real company with an office. Uh, so uh, I like them. I'm a fan. Um, the only other thing I would point out here, which you can't see, is Udemy. Anyone use Udemy, the library, Udemy? U-D-E-M-Y, Udemy, Udemy. Oh, yeah. It's uh, 1,900 curated courses. So it's, it's basically uh, YouTube videos, um, just better, right? So they're YouTube videos that are grouped by topic, grouped by subject, grouped by instructor, um, and Udemy allows folks to go in and shop around for the learning that they want, when they want it, where they want. So uh, we experimented with Udemy at the end of last year Sorry, the end of the year before last. Um, and we did a pilot for like 500, we went and bought 500 licenses to see what the appetite would be like and see how many people would take it. People signed up and logged in over 300 minutes of time on Udemy, learning really deep technical stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Node for JavaScript. Words that mean nothing to me, right? <laughs> they spent 300 minutes learning this online through Udemy videos. So we blew it out, we bought 3,000 licenses, and now we have it at scale across the organization, and we let folks use it, and folks love it, right? So Udemy for Business is a huge, it's a big win for PayPal. Folks want to be able to take the learning where they are in whatever format they want. It's all video-based. It's got a collaborative engine that you can talk to others who have taken the course. You can see all the ratings and everything else. Um, and if you go out and look for a topic, like, hey, I want to learn uh, Node for JavaScript, and you start to watch the first guy, and you hate the first guy. You're like, I hate this guy, I can't watch this guy, I hate this guy, and you bail on that guy. There's 12 more guys that you can pick from until you find the guy. You're like, I can listen to this guy. I can learn from this guy. And then you pick your guy, and then that's, your, and that's who you use. 
So it's a very cool tool. That's one that we've um, had real success with. Um, this year, uh, this quarter, we launched Coursera. So Coursera, you can go off and get certificates from colleges that matter and universities from around the globe. Um, so we stood that up this year. Uh, and when we stood that up this year, people snapped it right up. Yeah. Um, so we're experimenting this quarter. We're going to blow it out in H2 uh, to let more folks use it. That's great. All right, other stuff. Questions about the technology? Do you have, um, I mean, we can take this offline maybe, but do you have metrics for um, some of the differences in the impact that social media had? So we're trying to implement social media, we're getting pushed fast. Um, and I'd love to be able to get some really concrete numbers about what successful organizations who implemented Twitter, Facebook, and so forth to be able to say, we have engaged this many more people to learn yeah. based on that. Uh, so I don't have good metrics for you, right? I can tell you what the delta is between active learners and passive learners and how we're forever tracking our numbers for active learners. But I wouldn't be able to I wouldn't be able to isolate it was due to a direct impact from social media because it's all confounded. Right? It could be that sadly, it could be the town criers that we started to put up in the elevators um, that made the difference for higher learner engagement and folks coming. Um, we also started to exploit things like when you're standing in the cafeteria line, um, we took over one of the screens, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So uh, how much behavior that is driving versus how much behavior in your <clears throat> Facebook feed, mm -hmm. right? We're just trying to get in front of where people already are, so that was always the mental set. Right. Um, so sometimes we'll do uh, experiences that are big and loud, and if we do experiences that are big and loud, we do it with the doors open. We do it with the doors open for a really good reason. We want people to hear it, and we want them to see it, and we want them to be excited about it and say, what is that? <coughs> you know, we've done stuff in the courtyard. We've done learning fairs outside. We've done, because it's San Jose, you can get away with that nonsense. We did an outside, we did an outside learning fair in November, right? You can't do it here, right? But you can do it there. We gave out cupcakes, like silly, right? So I, it'd be tough, really tough to isolate uh, um, the impact that the social media side. I have silly numbers like how many folks are in the Facebook group and how many folks follow us on Twitter, but right. I don't, yeah, tough to draw, draw the connect to connect the next dot. Jim. So, <laughs> um, no, okay. Um, so how do how do people select the course? What I mean is, uh, do people can attend any course, any training, or how do you balance the business needs and like a personal inspiration or interest? You mean the full gamut of all this stuff yeah. that we offer? Yeah, well then you we have a full gang of the employees, right? They want yep. to take different things. Do they, how do they, you obviously have limit if, except it's online, right? Then how do, what, how do people be selected into the course? They can do that or you need to fit the business needs first. Let's say a finance guy want to learn about operation. Yep. That's like a personal interest, inspiration, and then a business need. How do you balance that? Or it's yeah. open to everybody. Yeah, so we don't set that standard. We'll um, talk about when you're building out your IDP to be sure to connect your learning to your IDP so that you've got good kind of rationalization and justification for why you're making, yep. as a finance guy, why you want to go out to Omaha and learn how our operations center work. Mm -hmm. By the way, if you're ever out in Omaha and you want to see how an operations center works, for people who are answering the phone with people who are really angry, like, my PayPal's not working. And they go, hi, thank you for calling. And then they have to talk them off the ledge. Um, that goes on at Omaha 24-7 in a bunch of, so that happens. Um, so if they really wanted to learn about operations, we have great classes about that. Um, and CLEP is the experience that we go to and it's a customer <coughs> leadership experience program and we'll send folks to shadow others who are actually doing that work and they shadow a specialist and they shadow a generalist and they get to really understand how truly terrible it is to support these products. It's so hard and it's such, un it, it's thankless work. Um, but if a finance guy wanted to go, that conversation is with the finance guy and his manager. Okay. We'll enable it. Um, the one condition we have set up in the LMS is that whatever you register for, your manager is copied. Your manager is not on the approval path okay. because that's not fair. Because if your manager is lazy, then, uh, then he doesn't get around to approving it and then you miss out on a seat or you miss out on an asset or you miss out on a... So we put the onus back on the manager saying, you were copied when you registered. So if you're not happy that he's going, that's on you, because you got the notification that he's registered to go. And some of these courses are not inexpensive. So we just did leadership at the helm, 
Leadership at the helm, we took uh, the 20 to five, six, say, 30-ish people out on six sailboats in San Diego Harbor. Um, nice. And we took them out and we made them do sailing. And then we brought, them, well, all right. We trained them first for four hours. <laughs> then we took them out and we made them sail. And then we came back. We we're like, how was that? We're like, that was terrible. We sucked at that. We're like, we know, because we tried to teach you and you wouldn't pay attention because you thought you knew and you thought it was going to be easy and you couldn't even get out of the harbor. Ha ha. Right? So we did that. Right? Um, then we did day two and then we did day three and they got better and better and better and then we made it a competition um, and then we set up all of these buoys and they had to get to different buoys and it was part of it was uh, the whole analogy with it's different parts of the market. And you had to make real-time decisions about what part of the market you were going to go after. Were you going to go after the ones that were close to shore that generated less revenue? You're going to go to the ones that were further out. And then we sent texts out to say, hey, by the way, there's one more customer. If you go way the hell out into the open, but the yield is way much higher if you want to go for it. But you got to coordinate with another boat to make sure you don't disappear over the horizon. And we had people that went and did it and did it rogue. And the other boat was like, you never asked us. We're not, we're not, no. You don't get the points. It's really, really, really fun, right? That's a really expensive class to host. So per person participant charge is mm, about 7,500 bucks, right? Uh, so we pass that expense on. We are not, uh, I don't have a big bucket of money, right, to give this. So we make it available to the business. We have stood stuff up that people have been like, this is awesome, we love it, and we're happy to pay for it. We have stood stuff up, people are like, this is awful, give us our money back. And we're not happy with you for the next, and we've said, okay, and we've done that. Mm -hmm. So we've had really good success and some significant challenges with doing that, uh, doing it in this way. Okay. Yep. What about embedding uh, learning within the work itself, action learning, any of that going on? So as far as folks who have come and then gone back to work and then we hold them accountable for what they're doing and doing differently or no. just in your everyday? In their everyday work. We're helping them to be able to figure out how they would learn as they are experimenting and trying new things. Yeah, so we have the 2070-10 balance that we focus on. We do say that from your IDP perspective, only 10% should be actual classroom kind of driven activity. Um, the 20% collaboration piece, we stand up in Slack. If you use that tool, it's a collaboration yeah. tool. Anyone can go off and uh, create a channel. And in your Slack channel, you can talk about whatever you want. And it's kind of, it's kind of untethered. And people get out and they start to bitch and moan about stuff, and then we have to come in as a moderator. It's, so that, there's that fun, but we let <laughs> folks collaborate and learn from others. Um, from the 70% that's expected what you're going to do on the job in order to be successful in your current job and prepare for your next, we have a whole suite of recommended tools that folks can use. A lot of it's lifted from the low merger competencies. Um, we've done some modification and customization of that content to make it a little more specific to the tech industry because it's not real, it's tech life. Um, so we've added on and bolted on, but that's the general split for folks. Now, we don't track that because we don't have direct visibility in that. I can track what happens from a training perspective in the LMS and say, this is the learning that they've accomplished in this space. But, well, so we toyed with the idea and we almost stood it up as self-reported. So we, we test and iterate pilot for everybody else, right? <laughs> we piloted, um, hey, if you want to do self-reported uh, self um, learning, you can do self-reported learning and it'll show up on your transcript. And we had a very binary kind of response. We had folks that were out there every damn day, I read an article, and, that, <laughs> like, and they put that on their learning plan, and like all of a sudden they're learning, like their learning history was pages long. And then we had people that didn't use it. So it's, yeah, it's way, so, we decided we hated that because um, it really just cluttered up our data, so we stopped. Um, and no one was, was really sad about it except for the guy was like, I can't report my own. I'm like, yeah, we know. Uh, but that was a very small minority, of course. Because your LMS has to log on. Is it? Easy to log on to. Uh, yeah. So it's SSO enabled if you're behind the firewall. And if you're not behind the firewall, you just use your SSO credentials and you're in. And you can do it from anywhere. I can do it from standard right. There's no dual authentication or anything? Nope. There's not that. There's no top secret stuff in there, yeah. right? There's nothing that we wouldn't, you know, share uh, in on the Wall Street Journal. So, you know, you know, I mean, we're pretty diligent about what we host in our LMS. I'll also share that our LMS has three points of entry. We have an LMS for employees. We have an LMS for uh, AWFs, which out here are contractors, alternative workforce, 
West Coast. Uh, so uh, our, our contractors, and then we have one for our customers. Um, and we just partition off the content so that they can see different things. So we have to be very careful about what's hosted in our LMS so that there's not the proprietary, because um, lots of folks have points of entry to get in. But we wanted it that way, right? We want to be able to put a lot of stuff out there that folks can use um, so that they can shop around. Okay. So uh, Cornerstone yeah. has a talent management component or module. Cornerstone does? Yeah. Yes, they do. And so do you take advantage of that to link some of what they're doing on the job? So you've got your IDP, you've got your activities, and then you can come back to it that way. So we don't, because we're a workday shop and all roads leads workday. <laughs> so we are trapped with workday recruit. Do you use it? It's terrible. Uh, <laughs> we are trapped with workday talent. We are, uh, we use Workday for their HCM, which is a good tool, honestly. Um, it's really tough What's for goal HCM? setting. What? HDM. HCM, your human capital management, human capital. All, the, all your data, right? All your data, HCM. So we use them, um, but all roads lead to Workday. I got a special pass for the LMS for two reasons. One, I showed up from eBay and I had it in my briefcase. It said, look, it's all done. And Workday at the time didn't have one. And now the Workday one is still on slide decks. It's actually not a tool yet. I went up there to Pleasanton because I'm in San Jose and I can do this. And I said, can you show it to me? And they're like, oh, we have this slide deck. I said, no, no. Can you show it to me? Yeah. They're like, so if you sit in this conference room, I'm like, no, no. Can you show it to me? And they're like, no, we can't show it to you. It's not even in beta. I'm like, excellent. Because we're about to renew our Cornerstone contract for the next three to five years. I'm like, thank you. But they're going to be years behind. Um, for coming up to speed, and we're not going to take functionality away just because all roads lead to one day. What else? Okay. Um, so this is a summary slide. Here's what we did. Moving away and moving towards. See, we're not going to have time for you guys. So moving away and moving towards, here's what we did. So um, we uh, moved towards being a product organization. Um, some of the stuff that we talk about now that we never talked about in the past. Right, MVP, minimum viable product. Yep. Aha, right? For those in a product shop, you're like, of course that's what it is. For those of us not in a product shop, you're like, who is the most valuable player? Uh, so MVP, shorten your loop lengths, all of that work, we stood up and we stood up quickly in order for us to be credible with our business. Um, we attend to all learners, so however they want it, wherever they want it, um, and in some cases, those who are the whiniest, uh, get the most of our attention and we solve for them first um, because mobile first was an important thing so we went and did that first because that was an important thing so that all of our stuff is mobile enabled. Most of our stuff is mobile enabled. If I ever said all of our stuff I think Eric on my team would kill me so yeah most of our stuff uh, is mobile enabled. Um, we look to the business roadmap and the priorities um, and then these are the only three things we measure. So I do not report out on butts on seat. I do not report out on penetration to your audience. I do not report out on overall cost and overall spend or ROI or any of that. Here are the only three measures that I'll report on. Career acceleration, sustained performance, and retention. So for the business, the question that I ask them when they're questioning, do I really want to spend 7,500 bucks for Derek to go sailing around in San Diego Bay, by the way, our next one is in Phuket, Thailand, and I know and that, one, that one's in May, and then the one in September is in Barcelona, because it's only fair that we do this all around the globe, so I drew the short straw and have to go to Barcelona in September. Yes. So, um, how much sacrifice? But I know the sacrifices I make. So when when we say, hey, do you want to spend seventy five hundred bucks on Derek to go to Barcelona to go sailing around? Um, the question that I ask the business is, do you want this person here longer? Do you want them taking on more work, and do you want them doing it better than those who don't go? If you want them here longer and you want them in a bigger job and you want them doing it better than others, then make the investment. If you don't, then don't. But those are the numbers that I'll come back and report on. So I always look at, this is my eligible learner population. Here are my active learners that you invested in. 
Here are my learners who you did not invest in. And then we track those three things. How quickly did they get to their next job in months? How long are they keeping a sustained high performance in our five point scale? You gotta have a one or a two in your five point scale. Um, and how long do they stay with the company in totality? And I always win, I always win, I always win. So if I take a group of active learners versus any other sample size group, the numbers are somewhere between two to six times better. And I go, see? So if you want them here longer and you want them doing bigger stuff and you want them doing it better than others, invest in learning. If you don't, if you don't want that, then don't invest. So that's, we, that's how we partner with the business. Um, and then the operational excellence and the superior products and the true customer intimacy, that was our three-year journey and our three-year roadmap. So we spent our first year doing operational excellence, fix the vendor, chaos. We spend the next year building out superior products, make sure what we offer is fit for purpose, fit for scale. Um, and then we constantly test and iterate and get feedback and work with and partner with our customers for them to understand what we're doing. Questions, comments, thoughts, reactions? Yes, ma'am. I'm here laughing, think about, thinking about uh, how good you must be to be able to sell retention directly related to L and D. There's so many other factors. Oh yeah, there's a ton of factors. Yeah, but we acknowledge that. Hey, it, it, when we look at it in its totality across those three dimensions, mm -hmm. the people who you actively invest in and and are act feel like they're part of the active learner community are likely to stay here longer than others. Mm -hmm. So that's a stolen metric from GE. So at GE, we used to measure our uh, early career program participants. So kids who are on FMLP, sorry, FMP, which is the Finance Management Program, EIMP, the Experience Information Management Program, CDLP, the Commercial Development Leadership Program. There were 14 of these. Those are the three I'm going to give you. Uh, so there were 14 different programs, and we would look at them versus the folks that we brought in direct from college. And the folks direct from college versus the folks that were on a two-year rotational program, five years later, were six times more likely to still be with the company. So the upfront investment is steep. The downstream yield is significant. Because for those that you don't invest in early, there's a six times likelihood that they're gonna leave the organization. So that's how we tick and tie back to the investment that we make. One more question, does anybody have anyone? Yes, ma'am. Have you been able to link learning back to employee surveys, satisfaction surveys? Yep, yep, so we have an annual survey and our annual survey asks four questions about learning. Um, three of them are total crap. Uh, but one of the questions um, actually says, do you get the training that you need to be successful in your current role? It's like a proper learning question. Um, and we've had a lift year over year for, for the last two years, year over year. Um, and our next survey is coming up in June. So we're about to lean in to see what those stats are like to folks who are feeling like they're getting the investment that they need to be successful. Hey, all well, big hands. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right, that wraps it for tonight. You cannot leave until you fill out your evaluations. Oh, oh whoops, whoops. <laughs> meanwhile, we'll actually do a little raffle. Oh. Well, Those who have not given Michelle their business card, oh. this is for, this is for a free meeting. Thank you. But I'm looking forward to the slide
Loretta Donovan. You don't look excited. You can all hear on Friday too. Well, with Mr. Mattimore here. What's happening on Friday? Boy, I tell you, I tell, I tell this whole story about the New England Area Conference, oh, and nobody oh, listens. Oh. <laughs> Let me tell you why I'm not in sales. My apologies. <laughs> All right. folks? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 